<laughs> That's a gavel in case you have to figure that out. Um, good evening and welcome to the January 3rd, 2013 BOHS number six board meeting and uh, first one of this calendar year. We welcome Mr. Johnson, Howard Weiss Tisman, the reformer, and Michael Bosworth representing the Town Finance Committee, I believe. And uh, the first uh, order of business is to have a public review of the budget. We uh, have our budget completed as always. Uh, there's little things that change, uh, particularly as it relates to the revenue, and I'll have Jim bring you up to date on that. Um, there are a couple of minor changes uh, that were made since my last copy, um, so I'm going to try to pick up on them as I go through. But the copy that you all have is the most up-to-date. And uh, I also would like to apologize for lack of names tonight. Um, those go in my bag all the time, but I've got so many pounds of budget papers in there that I, that I took them out temporarily and then uh, left them in my office. So we'll, we'll uh, toil under anonymity for a while, but I think we all know each other and hopefully the folks that watch regularly at home uh, recognize the cast of characters. So, uh, let's start in. What I would like to do is I'll do a uh, kind of a quick going through of the summary of the budget. Uh, I, I know better than to try to delve too deeply into the revenue because I get myself tangled up pretty quickly. I'm going to let Jim address that. Uh, but I, I guess I would make some, some opening comments about the, about the budget uh, and refer to page one, which is the first page, and we'll focus on the summary. Isn't that funny, Ruth? Page one is the first page. <laughs> I'm tired. Don't make me. Um, I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, and I'll, I just go through by the individual units. And I, I start off by saying that as in our usual fashion in October, uh, we get together with the administrators and kind of give them our general direction about budgets. And um, they're, they've heard this from us for years, quite a few years that uh, times are still economically challenging and we want them to put together budgets that will serve our students, give our kids what they need, and yet hold, uh, hold the line on expenses. And um, it becomes ever more challenging for them each year that we continually ask them to, to hold that line. But I have to say that they do a fantastic job of that. and. Uh, there was a lot of work, as usual, behind these budgets. Uh, we, we asked a couple of times to go back, sharpen the pencil a little bit more. Um, we, but they still had the challenge of not uh, negatively affecting the education that we provide. And that's a very difficult challenge, and we appreciate the effort that's been put into it. So uh, looking at, at page one, uh, the way it's laid out, it shows you all the way back to 2008-9, but obviously we want to focus on the last uh, columns, which is the 2013-14 proposed and the change. And people tend to think, when they t talk about budgets, most of the public tends to think in percent, you know, how much percent is it up? So we'll, we'll look at those numbers. And there are some minute changes from the ones that I may read, because I have notes on, a, on the last iteration that is now a couple of weeks old. So there's a couple of minor changes, and Jim will pick me up if I make a mistake. Uh, but looking at first at the district-wide budget, which is the things that affect all three units generally, maintenance, security, um, in that, in that budget, we were looking at an increase in about, of about 2.5%, 269000 um, We have put some uh, money into, a little more into operations and maintenance. As you recall, last year, 
we had special articles at town meeting for some capital expenditures. This year we are not asking uh, any special articles, but we have put some money in uh, maintenance and, and operations. This facility, uh, although we still think of it as a new facility, it, parts of it are approaching 10 years old now. What that means is that things start to need some work. And to not get in the situation that we were in when we started the project and that we hadn't done much of anything for a long time, we want to have a planned, organized program to maintain the facility. There will be an article to uh, uh, put uh, some money aside into a fund for uh, longer term capital uh, from our money that we have set aside. So, uh, But we have not uh, added special capital articles to this budget and as a result we have added some to the um, plan maintenance. And uh, just to quickly some of the items, uh, we have some ADA requirements that have been brought forth that we need to uh, deal with primarily uh, through the, the high school. Uh, we need to do some flooring work. We have two computer labs that are uh, almost dangerously unhealthy in the hot weather and we need to put some air conditioning uh, in, in those two labs. That's about 16,000. So there's four or five items and uh, then of course the routine maintenance and we're trying to get a, a painting program established here uh, because again after several years uh, and many thousands of students things need to be uh, fixed up a little bit. So um, there are, there's a, 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 some extra in the district-wide budget for that. Um, this, the special education part of the budget is, um, has held very well. And that, a lot of that is because we, not we, the special ed people, the board can't really take much credit for it, but uh, we've been able to reduce, keep the out of uh, district placements and the tuition down by keeping a lot of uh, these programs and, and kids in house. And that's been a, uh, uh, an ongoing, and, and it helps us in our budget process. Um, there are some other small increases in the district wide. Uh, we are uh, putting a, a little bit more into the dual enrollment program. Uh, that's been a tremendously successful program with, and probably an example for the rest of the state, uh, and allowing kids to end up with uh, reason, quite a bit of college credit when they graduate here. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a program we're quite proud of, and there's about another 20,000 put into that, not a huge amount. Um, and the WSESU assessment is up a little bit. That's what we get assessed for. Um, the services provided by the supervisory union. So, um, district-wide budget up about two and a half percent. That also reflects uh, salary uh, changes uh, for some personnel that are that are come under the district. Uh, in the senior high, a good job of controlling expenses there, and uh, that is up about two point four two percent. And just to give you an idea, I always, as a business person, I always like, well, how many customers do you have? And you size your operation based on your customers. Um, enrollment at the high school right now is about 860 or so, and this uh, budget projects 875. Uh, so basically level enrollment. Uh, in terms of staffing changes, there is a... Um, an addition in the budget for a student, to the student family interventionist, is that the, that's correct, is that the term, 25,000. And this is a position that will work to help reduce the rate of uh, dropouts or kids not graduating. And uh, it's been shown to be a very effective way if you can keep just a small number of those kids uh, uh, involved and engaged in school, and th this position would all would not always be working just during regular school hours. It would be meeting with families and some after hours things, and uh, um, so uh, it's it's felt that that will pay for itself in the in the long run. Uh, it's about 40 students a year that 
averagely that don't it varies. Right? Yeah, but thirty to forty. Yeah, so just to give you a general range, and if we can change that by a few, a handful uh, or more, that will be worth it. Um, in terms of the individual departments at the high school, uh, discretionary spending is basically all departments holding the line. Um, we we have invested. Uh, a little bit in, in uh, math and technology uh, and also in science, uh, textbooks primarily. And the fo in foreign language program, the Asian studies program costs us a little more because the grant is, is now disappearing. Um, but that's also been a very successful program and worth investing in and it's not a not a big number. So high school, uh, basically keeping things in line. Of course, there are health insurance all through this. Our health insurance is going to have a big impact. It goes up about 14%. Is that the yes. current number? Um, so that's that's a lot of dollars on the scale of the number of people that we have. And we are, uh, you know, in we do have a three-year contract uh, with the teachers in the in the first year of, which which did include some increases uh, and also the uh, non-certified staff. So um, salary and benefits are part of it, particularly insurance, uh, but other expenses are being held very firmly in line. Um, the next line down is uh, uh, WRCC tuition, and that would be the tuition um, from Brattleboro to the Career Center from the high school. Um, and we have a much bigger percentage of our Career Center attendees are Brattleboro now than it has been in the past, and that shows that we need to we need to do some work on recruiting from ascending towns, but uh, so that means that the uh, uh, tuition is affected because Brattleboro takes a bigger bigger share, of sending the most students. Um, so that is up. Uh, is that number changed a little, Jim? Yes. Okay. That's yeah. now. What does everybody have on their increase? Mine was probably ten point six one percent. Ten points. Okay. So percentage-wise, it still hasn't varied. Okay. Uh, BAMS. Uh, BAMS is basically overall uh, right on last year within a, within a few thousand dollars. Uh, enrollment uh, projection is, is down a little bit uh, from the current of, of about 250, Ingrid, um, projecting about 240, so a slight, a slight decrease. Uh, all the discretionary areas have been held level. Um, we uh, have uh, beefed up uh, tech ed a little bit uh, with a uh, para. Is that a para position or uh, part? No. Okay. <coughs> what do we What do we do? We put some money into equipment. Oh, that's in, all in equipment. Technology. Okay. All right. I got that one wrong. Uh, and also the beams program, which is a very valuable program. Uh, that has been a grant program uh, with a generally declining grant, but the value is, is tremendous. So we've said this probably the last few years that we have to put a little bit more in locally, and, uh, and we've done that. Um, so other than that, uh, all the discretionary spending at BAMS has been whole level once again. Uh, Career Center. Uh, up uh, about two percent, and enrollment there. That's a little tougher number to pin down because you have the uh, the number of total number of kids, the full time equivalents. You have the number of actual seats filled, and uh, so uh, we do. As I mentioned before, we we are actively, we've added some in the budget for advertising and promotion to try to get um, a little stronger involvement from the sending towns. And uh, uh, enrollment there is, uh, is off, has been off a little bit. So we looked at all the programs, uh, which we do every year, to make certain that the programs are still valid in terms of what 
the, uh, the business world and the, the world wants for employees and uh, also that they are programs that our, our kids are interested in and, and willing to become engaged in. So there have been some tweaking um, of a couple of programs, but uh, by and large, uh, the Career Center has not made any great um, program changes. So uh, the operating budget uh, increase comes to 2.83 percent, and uh, I don't know exactly what percentage of that is related to insurance and, and benefits, uh, but it's you know that 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 adds a lot to it, and, and a few other things that we we peaked up slightly, but basically held the line uh, on all discretionary spending. Um, below that line is where we gained some ground versus last year because, again, we have no uh, capital improvement um, specific items on the uh, agenda. Um, you see 150000 there, special article building fund. That's what will be the special article to request that we uh, put $150,000 from our reserves into that fund. You'll notice that debt service uh, drops a little bit. That helps. And also the track debt service drops a little bit. So the bottom, bottom line, um, operations wise, is 1.32 percent. Or, yeah, 1.32 now, Jim? What yes. 1.30 the other day. 1.32 percent, which I think <coughs> is, uh, is a responsible budget. And uh, I would then ask Jim to talk about the revenue side of it to uh, cover those expenses. Okay. Um, pages two and three of the budget handout uh, gives you the detail of the, uh, the revenue. And if I uh, had it to do over again, I'd flip pages two and three because the local revenue should really come first. So you have to look at page three. Uh, the top portion, local revenue funds, uh, we're anticipating an increase of $274,000, a little more than that. Uh, you can see the increases for uh, secondary tuition uh, at the top, $58,600. That's tuition from other uh, districts in the area. Uh, pupil uh, parent tuition, small increase of 2000 The increase is down below to the career center. Part of that is paid by you to yourself for the career center tuition. That's part of the process. Uh, Non-member tuition, you can see there's going to be uh, a small increase on uh, current non-member district tuition and a decrease in the debt service. Out-of-state uh, vote tuition, we've got uh, 109000 in there for Hinsdale. Uh, there's also a bond refund that's from the bond bank. We're going to be receiving a check in the next fiscal year to offset the expense, uh, principal and interest on the bond, which was refinanced a year ago. Um, we will have another uh, substantial offset in FY, I believe it's 16, um, and we're going to have to discuss how to treat that. Um, it's not going to be a reimbursement via a check. There's going to be a credit on the bond payment that year. Um, so I've got to follow up with uh, our CPA and get the best way to treat that. Uh, my initial feeling is to try to spread the benefit of that credit over time versus taking it all in one year. Uh, and when I get the details, I'll be back uh, to the board and can review it. The subgrants, <clears throat> the majority of that money is uh, from federal funds that comes in via the uh, supervisory union. We're expecting a decrease of approximately 114000 there was a little bit of money in there from uh, Perkins uh, subgrant from New Hampshire. If we get some, it'll be additional revenue. There's none anticipated at this time. 
the top of page two shows the summary of the state funding. And if you drop down, you can see uh, decreases uh, in special ed block grant intensive aid, but there's an offset in extraordinary special education aid. Um, down lower, there's uh, state funding for the Career Center, co-op ed guidance director, and the net decrease there is 30 some odd thousand. There's a net anticipated decrease in general state support for vocational education of 40,000. And the big number at the top, the general state support, uh, that number, 19,398,616, is the total we receive from the state, which includes the local taxes and also state aid. Uh, you can see it's a 2.62% increase. That is a plug number. You can't, you, you don't calculate it. You take your total budgeted expenses, you subtract your revenue from all other sources, and if you look at the bottom of the page in the lower right, just have a recap of FY14 budget, $27,800,363, less the offsetting other revenue, other than general state support of $8,401,747, and you get the $19,398,616. So that's, that's a plug figure. That's the number that, that's your education spending number. That makes, uh, um, has an impact on your actual taxes, which we'll get to in a second. The federal uh, revenue, uh, as you can see down below, there are education jobs funding grants, which we had for the past two years, that's gone away. So that money is, is, is a decrease, the revenue. That's money we have to make up locally. And then the fund balance, that's the use of uh, surplus funds to decrease taxes. This current year, we've offset the expenditures by a million two eighteen. The proposed is to offset by one million one hundred and fifty thousand, which would be one hundred and fifty thousand to be deposited into the building improvement fund if the voters uh, vote to establish that, and one million dollars to defray taxes for FY fourteen. There's a three page, uh, there's a cover and then two pages, a three year comparison, uh, which reviews the tax implications. And it's a three year comparison, but I've got uh, eight listed on there. More information about it. Uh, so what this does is it estimates the education residential tax to be 91 cents for the coming year. We don't know at this point what it's going to be. Uh, we've heard estimates from anywhere from two cents to five cents. It uh, estimates that the base state education payment amount will be $8,897. Uh, by formula, that figure is supposedly going to, supposed to be over $9,100, but the legislature uh, chooses not to fund that at the calculated rate uh, most years lately. So, uh, if you go to the FY14 column on page one, at the top, you'll see our budget figure 27,800,363. I've just noted the SU assessment. The revenue, local revenue, other than general state support is 8,401,747. And if you subtract that other revenue from your total proposed budget, you get education spending of 19398616 That matches that number on the revenue page. Uh, equalized pupils, 1,200 students. You have an education spending per equalized pupil, 16166 District spending adjustment, which is 16,166 divided by the base education payment of 88.97. So you have a district spending level of 181.696%. The, um, that shouldn't say 92 cents. On line 30, residential education tax, it should be at 91 there. 
Um, but you can see there's a calculated total rate of 165.34. Then if you flip the page, top of uh, page two, the far right, FY14, the state spending cap is 15,456 for equalized student. And if we take our calculated figure of 16,164, remove the eligible debt service of 1370 per student, and the $10 for excess special ed spending per student, it comes out to a net of 14,784. So you can see we're $672 under the spending cap per equalized pupil. The lower portion, it just recaps the projected residential tax rates for FY14. Uh, you can see Brattleboro's, if you go to the, uh, I don't have a colored copy or so, that the lower darkened line, the estimated tax increase for Brattleboro for FY14 based on the common level of appraisal, 91 cent, uh, base residential rate is 3.51 cents. The increase for Dummerston is 3.33. There's a decrease of a little under a penny for Guilford. There's a decrease of a little over eight cents in Putney. And there's an increase of seven tenths, a little over seven tenths of a cent in Vernon. So if there are any any questions? Uh, Jim, back fire. Yeah. on, uh, where is it, uh, special ed extraordinary aid, what, mm -hmm. what is that? Any, any student for which you spend over $50,000 each, you get 90% of that excess back and additional revenue. So it's, it's a safety net. If, uh, you know, whether it's a big district or a small district, if you have really intensive needs, students move in, there's a cushion. So they make up the difference. Yeah. What happened to the Medicaid subgrant at 25000 The Medicaid money is, uh, well, number one, federal aid is, uh, some of it's in jeopardy. Uh, we had a, redu a reduction in the current year and we're looking ahead and just proposing that there's going to be uh, more of a reduction for FY14. So it's just to be realistic and conservative. Um, you know, this budget is, you know, if I'm a little under on tuition and we have excess, it's going to more than make up for a few things. But I'd rather not be overly optimistic on federal revenue at this point. Any other questions? Yeah, Jim, why are the tax rates different in the different towns? I think I know, but just to be sure. Well, uh, part of it is the, the common level of appraisal. <laughs> right. And the uh, the district share of uh, students that are considered secondary versus elementary. And you can, if you look across uh, in the middle of that page, uh, page two on the three year comparison, it says tax allocations. So 50%, 50.7% of the equalized pupils in Brattleboro are allocated towards the high school's tax. Dummerston, it's only 27.68% of those students are grades 9-12. Guilford, 38.07, grades 9-12. Putney, 33.76, 9-12. Vernon, 36.43, uh, 9-12, uh, 7-12, excuse me, to the high school Plus, in the Vernon budget, they have an amount because they have a voucher program for kids that are tuitioned out. 
And so why would that impact the tax rate? Well, you get a larger share. You know, the reason Putney is, it has a decrease here is because of a shifting between the secondary, uh, the 912 enrollment, and the pre-K grade 8. If that number shifts a lot, or relatively a lot, in any given year, it shifts the share of the tax. And you can see it on the town. That's why for the towns, when I do their budgets, I still put in the high school tax piece because they like to look at the whole amount. We've had years where, because of the shift, the high school budget could be up X and the tax is down, but at the local level, the tax rate is, is more. So, you know, it's, it's kind of taking it out of context. I like to have the education tax group. I can give you the preliminary, uh, probably all of them by, by next week but uh, it gives them a better idea. That's a moving target. It's, it's not, uh, you know, to prorate the tax that way, it's a mechanism to, uh, you know, get to a result. It's just part of a formula that the legislators uh, approve and we have to deal with. Uh, because any given year, you can make a case while the expense of the high school for, say, Putney in relation to Putney Central School uh, shouldn't change that much, but it's, it's dictated just on the number of kids. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just it's, it is what it is, you know, it's part of the formula. I, I can't, I just have to deal with it and try to, uh, you know, make sense of it for the taxpayers so they can make an informed vote. But the CLA also does have an impact, it looks like. The CLA in the base. In, yeah, in the base. If, right. if everything was constant, all the numbers were constant, and you had a base residential increase uh, on the tax rate of two cents, the increase for all the towns would be two. You're starting at that point. But the other factors, the equalized <clears throat> counts, with the allocations in the CLA impact that. Mm -hmm. They all shift. Because you could, you know, you can make a case saying, well, while Vernon, okay, their tax rate goes up seven tenths of a cent, you know, why should Brattleboro go up three and a half? I, I don't know. If everything was <laughs> constant, they'd all they'd all go up the same amount. But they're different. They're different variables, and you get different results. <clears throat> questions for Jim? I have a, a, just a question, Jim. How does, how does Vernon get to 111% CLA? Property values go down? Uh, you you had reappraisal not that long ago. Fairly and, long. and when uh, many of the towns had reappraisals more recently, the starting point for the CLA rate was 115 to 120 20 plus. So it goes from there. The, the interesting thing is uh, Dummerston's actually decreased a little. I believe uh, Brattleboro's, uh, I don't know, it was pretty flat, but I think Guilford, Putney, and Vernon actually did go up a little, which means that the prior year, based on values, they were selling for less, and then it, it kind of balanced out the economy. I don't know. It's kind of an indicator, maybe you know, sorry, house sales, home sales, that it's improving a little. But at some point, they're all at 100 percent. Yes. Yeah. Kind of yeah. When, when they're passing in the night. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah, they get there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and part of the the CLA, it's there to. You know, it's it's not a perfect uh, formula, but uh, it's it's pretty good for equity. And what they do, it's it's really a, kind of a self-equalizing 
uh, formula in Guilford, because they're at 85, the tax rate is adjusted upward. So in theory, even if you know Vernon is 111.18 and Guilford's 85, you're paying an equitable tax based on your education spending. And it will be as soon as reappraisal is done, then everything changes. Correct. So it just has to do with where the towns are in yes. the appraisal. Yes, in the cycle. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. My coach has a question. Uh, I call, um, the 14% the increase in health care costs, the, the, what does that, is there a figure that tolls to as far as uh, more money being spent in fiscal year 14 versus 13 for the district? Or approximation? Well, it's in excess of 200,000 gross. 200,000 yeah. more than the yeah. previous year? Yeah. And if, that, if the renewal rate comes in lower in the next, you know, it's got to be soon, um, you know, I can adjust that. Even if it doesn't, you could actually, you know, you could amend the, the number uh, at the annual meeting, amend the budget down, downward. Because that, that was a big... Uh, it was a big shock. I mean, we were used to more recently increases that have been in the range of three to five percent. Um, I can remember years where it was 15 way back, but uh, 15 percent. But when you're talking about plans that cost 13,000 to you know 17,000, and you're putting a 14 percent increase on it, um, most cases you've got more of an increase in health benefit cost than you do in compensation. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of unusual. I, I have a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, the one hundred fifty thousand um, dollar that's going to be would come out of reserve, but it would go into a special fund for uh, maintenance. Is that? I just want to understand a little bit more. Is that? Would that Correct. Building improved. Yes. Uh, and so that'd be used all, all used up in one fiscal year. No. No, that'd be spread. No. Uh, it's going to be because of the acreage of roof. Uh, the fact that there's a finite life on the uh, wood chip boiler, um, where it's really a uh, replacement fund. The money that goes in, the only way it can come out is with voter approval. Mm -hmm. So we're just starting to set aside money. Uh, as Bob mentioned, you know, we have a new facility, but it's already eight plus years old uh, in, in, you know, some areas or, or nine. Um, so we've, we've got to do that. I, I think it has to be really, uh, you know, focus of the district. I, part of the problem um, <clears throat> with, the, with the old facility I mean, there, there were different issues because, you know, one wing was built in the 50s, early 50s, another wing was built at a different time, another wing was built in the 70s. And, you know, if you went through the building, you could see, you know, or if you drove up to it, you could see the quality, the difference. Uh, you know, things, things were done, uh, you know, at certain points relatively inexpensively. The construction maybe wasn't uh, what it would have been if uh, resources were more available. And I think the district, you know, once the building got to a certain point, there, there wasn't a lot that could be done as far as renovating certain areas. Um, you know, it was, it was such uh, poor quality. And then the systems, you know, over time, ventilation and heating, I mean, it's, you know, changed immensely back from, uh, you know, you get gravity systems back in the, in the 50s and, you know, to, you know, computerize now. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, maybe it was such a daunting task to think about replacing, um, you know, that we didn't, we didn't do things that, you know, we probably should have as far as uh, maintenance. Um, I think uh, the administration, you know, Robert, 
Clark, uh, plant engineer, have, have that in focus and uh, have been devoting uh, money to do that the, the right way versus letting too many things go into disrepair. Um, so, you know, every year some might be added to that sort of dedicated the, fund. That was the intent, yeah, on the Goldenrod sheet, uh, the five-year plan, you kind of, uh, there's, there's a lot more to add on here because, you know, Robert had uh, lines and then we've kind of uh, taken certain things away. The FY14 items to the 15498, those are, those are all included in operations maintenance for FY14. So the capital improvement reserve fund for the five years uh, next year and the four thereafter, we've got 150 in each year, and that could that could change. Mm -hmm. But I think we we have to really focus on uh, you know devoting the resources to keep on top of any you know roof replacements. And as I mentioned, the the wood chip. Uh, you know, part of the problem. It's been a great system. There have been some you know, unbelievable savings, which I can get together with Robert, we can put something out at, for the annual meeting. Uh, but I can, I can look back in the records and there were years we were burning, you know, 200,000 gallons of oil. Um, you know, at 350, that's 700,000. And you look at uh, what we paid for wood pellets last year in oil uh, was under 100,000. So since it went online in 2004, you know, it's, it's substantially more than a million dollars, you know, that have been saved and, and you can, and the school can devote those resources to education and not, you know, eat. So I know that this 150 has to go to the voters to approve, uh, once that, uh, fun builds up. Do you have to ask the voters again how to spend that? Yes. So you build money up, and then if you want a roof, you have to advance again. Okay. And when is the annual meeting? February 12th. 12th. February 12th? Yeah. Thanks. Not on Valentine's Day for a change. <laughs> well, we've, as a board, we've over the last couple of years been talk, trying to look a little further ahead with the capital plans and some of us uh, including myself have lived through about 50 years of BUHS and from the time the middle school was brand new and uh, those in my generation started messing it up I guess uh, and over the 50 years seeing particularly towards the end when it I think as Jim said it became almost an overwhelming task it was just you know we, we can't heating and ventilation and so forth uh, I think we're really wanting to be able to get that fund going and, and keep it going and be able to do these things uh, as needed and uh, keep keep ahead of the curve. Somebody else had a question or comment? Okay. Well, uh, that will conclude the public session on the budget. Um, we have a regular meeting, but I would like to propose that we take a 10-minute recess or so and then uh, reconvene. You can vote on that. I just hit the can on the table. The recess. recess. And thank you, folks, for joining us. I'll, call, I'll refer to you as the gentleman from Brattleboro and the, the lady from Dummerston, just like in the legislature. <laughs> 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 okay, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of us. Okay, well, we'll uh, go ahead and get started here uh, on the regular agenda. And the uh, first item is the clerk's report and approval of minutes from December 17th. Is there a motion? So moved. Laurie? Second. Ricky? Okay. Discussion? Any additions, deletions, corrections? 
If not, all in favor of approving the minutes of December 17th, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Everybody this here? Okay. Um, communications. Anything from communications? Okay. If not, uh, anything else for the clerk's report? Okay, recognition of groups and individual visitors. Uh, we had some visitors for the budget session. Uh, we do not have any now, just the usual folks that are here. And uh, so we move on to consent agenda. And I would accept the motion when the consent agenda. So moved. Second. I move by Russ, seconded by Sean. All in favor? Aye. Opposed or abstentions? Seeing none, we are in consent agenda. We start with finance. Okay, finance met on the 19th of December 2012, and we approved warrant numbers 1107, 1108, 1109, 1110, 1113, 1114, 1115, 1116, and 1117 for a total of $279,644.97. And we had no payrolls, and aside from those things, pretty much we talk more about the budget. Ongoing discussion over the last couple of months. Okay. Planning and policy. Uh, planning and policy met earlier today. Um, we discussed the policies that we'll be talking about in unfinished business. And also, we have established a procedure for reviewing our local board policy because our current procedure left them out and they have been reviewed in some time. <coughs> Uh, so in future packets, what we're going to be doing is adding a local board policy on with each packet that comes through from the SU. So you'll all see that one extra uh, tacked on. Roughly how many local board policies are there? I don't know. Scores or hundreds? It's not, it's not, it's not, it's like it's not a lot. Yeah, it's like 12 or something like that. Okay. That it? That's it. Okay, thank you. Teacher Curriculum Committee. Has not met since our last week. Okay, BAMS Committee. Also has not met since our last week. WRCC. Has not met, has not met since our last week. <laughs> okay, wow. And anything else? If not, uh, that must be it for consent. Is there a motion to accept consent agenda? So moved. Second. Mike and Mike, Ruth P. Lori by a no second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Unanimous. Okay, what I would like to do is uh, move the agenda around slightly uh, and take up the action on the budget so that uh, Jim was graciously joined us and uh, helped us uh, keep squared away, particularly on the revenue side of things. Doesn't have to. Um, sit through the whole meeting. So I would like to move that up and uh, take up the budget, which we reviewed. Uh, I think everybody's had several chances to look at it. There's been some revisions. Some of us have looked at it till we're cross-eyed. Um, so uh, we will take that up now, and I would accept a motion to approve the budget. Okay, and would you make the motion and with the dollars in there? What? <laughs> you the are you sure you want to? <laughs> this is a 2013-14 proposed budget. I move the 2013-2014 budget in the amount of $27,800,363. Second. Okay, seconded by Sean. Discussion. Yes. 
Last chance to vote. Glory. I discarded my superseded copies, which include my notes. So if someone could just refresh my memory, please. The goldenrod sheet, which is the operations and maintenance planning outlook, outlook for FY14 projected total $150,498. That is included on the district-wide budget under planned building maintenance, which is a higher number. Yes. But we just have a list of part yes. of that item, yes. that line item. Yes. Good. That's what I thought, but I just wanted to be sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. We should have a motion that discussion cease probably on this. Or not. We just vote on the vote, vote on it. Okay. All right. We have a motion on the floor. It's been seconded. And it uh, is to approve the 2013-14 budget at $27,800,363. All in before you, uh, we're, we're approving it to present to, to present, right, uh, board uh, approval, and it will go to the, the annual meeting on February okay. 12th. Uh, yeah. I, I think probably the correct term is we accept this budget. Accept it, okay. I, I think. No, I'm not the, the board means to actually approve it. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Okay, so we Accepting have a subject to. Yeah, and then <laughs> the board presents it at the annual meeting, and it's up to the voters to approve it at that point. Yes. Okay. Well, we can accept it and approve it. Yes. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. No one read the figures? Are we not going to read the figures? Mm -hmm. We just did. 27,800,363? Yeah, okay. it, was, it was right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Opposed or abstentions? Unanimous. And it will move forward to the voters on February 12th. Okay, and thank you as <coughs> always. It's been a thank you, Bob. pleasure having you at meetings. <laughs> We'd like to schedule a few more. Just to... I, I would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we probably have a, a plenty of plenty meetings to go to. Okay, so we back to that. Um, so we'll move on to administrative reports. And uh, why don't we start with student council? Uh, so we wrapped up Project Feed the Thousand the day before Christmas break. Um, it was a bit tight, but we ended up meeting both our goals, uh, both monetary and in terms of uh, food, donatums, uh, food donations. And those were uh, corralled by Project Feed the Thousands along with other schools from around the district and other drop-off locations of businesses. So that was a success by all means. Uh, we also were able to uh, continue busting those baskets, which we've been collecting fresh uh, fruits from the cafeteria from students who aren't eating them and then donating them to the, to the drop-in center after school a couple times a week, which has also uh, been well well received, so that's been going very well. And uh, in terms of what's up next, we just got back from Christmas break, obviously. We haven't had a full meeting since then, so not exactly sure where we'll be going from here, but I'm sure you'll hear for us in the future. Okay. Looking forward to that. Ingrid, going on at AMS? Um, well, we've been back to school, I guess, four days since we last met as a school board. Um, but we had a great uh, re-entry yesterday. Uh, the kids were quite happy to be back. Um, I can tell you that going to classes was number two on their list of why they were happy to be back. <laughs> However, uh, they were so happy to see their friends and um, teachers as well. Uh, and the teachers were happy. I think the amount of time we had over the break was just about right and um, people were refreshed. And it, was, it was a nice feeling. Um, we, uh, I know that the board had concern um, with the BAMS uh, budget reduction of the peak program 
And so today, with members of my office team, we worked on what the peak program schedule would look like, uh, assuming it's a 0.5 FTE as now represented in the budget, and began to talk about the changes in that program that we would like to see. And we're feeling quite positive that, first of all, the changes we would make are very positive, that students would get support in their regular ed classes through the peak paraeducator, and then during the time that they're in the peak program, that paraeducator would follow them back into the program, and there would be um, good cohesion between and among core classes and peak program, and that the focus of their time in peak would really be on experiential education, project-based learning, um, with a focus on career, and college, which is what the Common Core is really moving us toward. So it was, um, we had a very good meeting today to look at how to shape that program, and I am very confident that we will have an effective service in place for kids there. Um, is that peak with two E's or It's EA, e -A. and it's all uppercase letters, yeah. And it doesn't have doesn't stand, stand for anything, anything, does it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike BEAMS, which was my next topic that does stand for something, um, on Monday we have a full day work session with the BEAMS Advisory Board, uh, of which I'm a member, Betsy Stacy is our director, and our goal is to finalize the writing of this grant that I've apprised the BAMS committee of. It's due by January 31. It's actually due February 2, but we're saying January 31. But we just got a preliminary report from our three-year site avail, and we were um, described as an exemplary program and a model for the state. And we've been told that, but to see it in writing is really wonderful. And it's just in draft form. I will share copies of it with the BAMS committee when we get the full report. But I am overly confident, I guess, but not unduly, that we will secure this grant. Uh, renewal grant for five years. Today, Jim King came to BAMS and met with Betsy, Stacy, and me to look at the whole budget piece of the grant renewal, and that was a very helpful session. We spent an hour and a half with him today, and I really appreciated his, uh, I wish I could have said this when he was here, but, you know, he's incredibly busy right now, as you all know, and so to give us that time was much appreciated, but it will help us moving forward. Um, I got exemplary program and what was this? Uh, a model for the state. There'll be more that I can share. To you. But that's all I can remember at the moment. <laughs> um, but otherwise, um, I was just looking at my calendar. Something else did show up and I can't remember now what it was I wanted to uh, share with you. Um, um, oh, I know what it is. Um, you all may have seen um, the story of the tragic account of the passing of Alan Young Bryant. Um, there was an article in the Reformer uh, a week or so ago. Um, Alan's mother, Judy Van Wagenengen, was a longtime social studies teacher at BAMS, has now since retired from there. Alan himself um, was a middle school student at BAMS, um, moved from BAMS to a private high school and then went on to um, Tufts University and then Cornell for a PhD in Victorian poetry. Well, on December 5th, Alan um, had a very um, untimely and um, tragic death in Ithaca at Cornell campus. He fell uh, off a walkway down a gorge. And he was 32 years old. It's quite tragic, quite unfathomable. I knew Alan, I taught him when he was a student at BAMS. Uh, his mother and I have been good friends since we knew each other years ago. And so um, there is a memorial service for Alan coming up a week from this Sunday on January 13th. And his mother has asked that if, should there be uh, contributions made in memory of Alan, that they be sent to one of three places which includes Cornell, English Department, uh, Northfield, Mount Hermon, where he graduated from high school, and the BAMS, BEAMS program. And so we would be, should there be funds, 
one of three recipients, and that was part of our conversation with Jim today about setting up an account through our budgeting system to receive funds that would help to um, support the BEAMS program as well. His mother specifically wants the money to be used for uh, after school and summer programming for students in um, the creative expression areas. And we have plenty of examples of BEAMS and summer programming opportunities for kids that fall within that. So um, Betsy and I wrote a statement that will be in the program on January 13th, and it will be presented to those who attend the memorial. I will be there as well. Um, and so there may be um, memorial funds coming our way in memory of Alan Young Bryant. Did he partake of any of those <coughs> activities at BAMS, or were there, was there anything? No, there? we really didn't have. Um, I know Beans was. Right, right. He was um, an exceptional student, athlete. Um, very, very tragic. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing young man. So I just wanted to, to share that with you. Um, and as we shared at our last meeting, our ongoing evaluation and deliberations around our safety procedures are continuing. Um, we, we haven't lost sight of our need to continue to evaluate what we have in place and make appropriate changes. Um, we are continuing as a whole team to work on that. Thank you. Mr. Barron. I'm not sure what Ingrid is talking about. Our students, their first priority is getting to classes. <laughs> When they walk in the door, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we are actually glad to be back as well. Um, and as Ingrid said, it was, I think, the perfect length break for, for staff and for students. Um, when we come back from December break, our focus really shifts towards final exams because they're coming up in a week and a half. And so uh, a lot of the effort of teachers and students has moved towards project-based things, summative evaluations, and, and final exams coming up in a couple of weeks, and so um, the tenor of the school changes quite a bit these, past, these next two weeks, and then after Martin Luther King Day, we'll start with our new semester. Um, the other <clears throat> news I have is, um, I think we all know, um, is not quite as good. Uh, on December 18th, former Barbara Union High School principal Everett Masters passed away at age 72. Um, Everett was a principal here for a year, uh, between uh, Bernie Sprague's retirement and Jim Day's arrival. And I worked with Everett as a teacher. And Everett is still remembered fondly among the faculty. And whenever people speak of him, it's with great respect and great fondness, Everett. Um, I didn't know him in his other roles. I just knew him in this role. And he was a, uh, a very classy gentleman and really took the time to talk to teachers and really took the time to work with kids. And so his influence is still here today. So I would ask the board for a quick moment of silence. Thank you. Um, the services are, for Everett, are this Saturday at 11 o'clock at Center Congregational Church in downtown Broadway. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Hunter. Okay. Thank you. He yields the floor. I yield the floor and we'll thank you very much. Um, yeah, this is a, 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 always an interesting time, much like the high school. We're in transition as you know, courses wrap up and we'll begin to move into a second semester. It's also the period of time where we really begin to seriously look at our, uh, our recruitment activities for next year. Uh, so we spent most of this, these last few days and certainly some time before the Christmas vacation beginning to schedule those activities and uh, uh, because it involves uh, contacting all of the eligible students and trying to meet with all those eligible students at all of our Sunday high schools. And that's really becomes the priority for the rest of the year for us and the administration as we move through. <coughs> That's it. Okay. Central office. 
Yeah, I'm going to bump up the warning articles so we make sure we get these signed. These are the uh, three copies of the warning articles that would need to be signed by all board members. And um, we'll just kind of circulate those and make sure that three copies come back. Later on, we will assign the articles for the annual meeting. You know, people choose to present particular articles. And some of you have your favorites, and we will look those up to make sure that we have those uh, when we start dividing them up. Um, I want to circulate a um, document that is entitled 2012 School Director Attendance. This has been requested to put in the um, annual uh, report. Uh, we've done this in the past. And I just want to make sure that one, you're not surprised by it, and two, if you take a look at yours and you see that you think there's something wrong about the attendance, just let us know before we um, have that published. So you'll, you'll have a chance to take a look at it and if you need to write a comment on it, you can just, again, make sure that I get it back. Or it would be helpful to just initial it if you're... Yeah, that would be great. Seen it. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I, I may have missed the last meeting and Steve may have talked about um, some of the emergency precautions and um, planning that we have scheduled. I know uh, UHS administrators and myself have a June, uh, January 22nd session. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that um, all the principals, the outline principals met today, uh, that would be Putnam, uh, Gunnison, Guilford, Vernon, with the um, State Police Barracks Commander, Paul Favreau, and one of his um, sergeants. And essentially, we, we wanted a session with him to uh, review our emergency crisis plans, um, talk about lockdown procedures and our other protocols uh, for emergency um, fire drills, bomb threats, um, those sorts of things. Uh, we talked about incident command setups in terms of when a crisis happens at a school, how does law enforcement interact with the uh, school administration, the principal, the superintendent, the staff, that sort of thing. Uh, we've done a lot of that with the VY um, trainings that we do, so I think as I've said in the past, we're one of the districts that probably does um, more emergency preparedness because of that, uh, those scenarios. Uh, we talked about exterior doors and main entrances. We talked about inter interior doors and locking systems and uh, the importance of having school floor plans. Um, so it was, it was a very good meeting with the outline principals. We have one scheduled for the Brattleboro Town principals next week. And as I mentioned, uh, Steve had coordinated a meeting on January 22nd. And uh, we're going to have Brat PD, the sheriff, Sheriff Department, uh, Fire Department, and um, maybe the state police, they haven't gotten back to me yet. And then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to actually sit down and, and work through um, their view on how, how a crisis might unfold here. And then after we work through that, we're going to ask them to sit down with us again and, and review our protocols to find out. So we want to make sure that what we're telling our staff and students is congruent with what they would do in that situation. So. Um, we did it about three years ago, uh, so it's time to do it again. Yeah. So. And, and I'll tell you, the, um, the, the new barracks commander at, uh, in Brattleboro, Paul Favreau, is very responsive, very helpful, and um, so I think it's, it's a nice connection that we're making with, with them. Um, I have some other things later on, a couple of things in executive session, but that's it for now. All right, I believe that's it for administrative reports, and we move on to unfinished business. And we have some policies to deal with. And you're up, Ian. All right. With the, uh, with the holiday season, communication has been a little off, so I really have not gotten any of the question and answer and done on F5, so we're still not ready to move that forward. And could I just comment on that? Um, I've contacted Vermont School Board Association, and, and they've, they've got the information, but they've, they'll be responding pretty soon, I think. I think it's a holiday season. Yep. Other stuff's going on. 
Um, Planning policy met today and reviewed the other five policies that are here for additional reading. And we had <coughs> no concerns or comments on any of them. So unless anybody else does, we're ready to move those forward to uh, final reading and approval next uh, session. And those are uh, E10, School Crisis Prevention and Response. Uh, F4, searches, seizures, and interrogations of students by school personnel. F17, 18-year-old students. F18, age of attendance. And G10, uh, special education. Uh, the one note I would make uh, to your question, Ingrid, um, I haven't asked that question yet, but our sense is, although we need to know that for the implementation of the policy, it doesn't really make any difference to the policy itself. Right. Is that one of the questions that's currently at the VSBA right now? Uh, not yet. Yeah, no, I have not. I haven't sent the email on that yet. Okay. What, what, what? You want to know what the question is? Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, how that uh, policy specifically Uh, the clause in F4, uh, searches, of, searches of students, persons, personal effects, and vehicles may be conducted where there are reasonable grounds for suspecting at the time of initiating the search that the search will reveal evidence of a violation of law or of school rules. Uh, the search of the scope must be reasonably related to the objectives of the search and not excessively intrusive in light of the student's age and sex and nature of the infraction. Uh, the question was whether this uh, would apply to cell phones and other electronic devices. Glad you asked that question since I happen to have this material. Can you answer? Yes. Wow. <laughs> All you need to do is ask. <laughs> well, I well, you know, I, I, I knew there were potential questions from the um, SU meeting. <clears throat> when we adopted F4. And any of you that attended that meeting um, may have seen this document. I marked it up a little just because I want to make sure I highlight the areas that were concerned. You guys saw me, so let's see this right. So it, it may be a roundabout way of uh, getting to the answer, but I just want to send a couple more to you. So um, this was a, um, a question that um, came up earlier with F4, and so Nicole Mace is um, the legal representative for the Vermont School Board Association. And so I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, as I said, I wouldn't at the SU meeting, but I then did. Um, second sentence, the only, the only time that reasonable cause is needed for school officials is to conduct a search in which an area where a student has reasonable expectation, expectation of privacy. Um, so uh, Supreme Court case TLO versus New Jersey has evolved um, to define areas such as students might have a legitimate expectation of privacy. These areas include purses, backpacks, cell phones, and the person in the So those are the, those are the areas that there's a reasonable expectation for privacy. Um, if, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Can I say something? Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. So it says to me that according to the policy, that if we have reasonable grounds for suspecting uh, that there, the search will reveal a violation of a law, right. you have to have those reasonable grounds. Right. Then, in fact, we may look at a student cell phone. That's right. As long as we have can demonstrate we have those reasonable grounds. Right. And it's and it's different. It's a different standard for school officials than law enforcement. Yeah. Um, the, the next paragraph is really important, I think. The idea that schools have greater flexibility to search areas where students do not have a, a legitimate expectation of privacy. That is, they, they do not have to demonstrate reasonable cause. What they're saying there are things like um, their the lockers, uh, a computer, that school property. So there shouldn't be the expectation to a student that that's 
private, you know, and it's safe, don't worry about that. That's where schools get into trouble when the <coughs> students think, okay, I'm okay to put stuff in here when in fact it's school property and there shouldn't be that expectation for privacy. So um, I, thought, I thought Nicole broke this down pretty well in terms of those sorts of questions. So hopefully that does. It helps enormously. I, I had a case just two weeks ago with a cell phone and I did not go into the phone and it delayed the investigation uh, to the point where further action is not going to be taken by authorities because of the delay. But this now really would have allowed me to look at that phone. We had a reasonable suspicion it proved true. There were grounds for that search, and as it turned out, there was a violation represented. Is it made clear somewhere in the student handbook or something that um, there is no explicit right to privacy in the locker and school computers and that sort of thing? It's it, yeah, it's in our acceptable use policy. It's also in the student handbook. Okay. That lockers, the locker, yes. lockers remain yes. property of the UHS. And the acceptable use would be the computer use. Right. Is there a definition for either reasonable expectation or reasonable cause, or is that just? Uh... There's there's a, a standard in law for law enforcement for probable cause. Right. Um, there's, there's, there's a different standard for school officials. So if, um, you know, I'm just trying to think of a recent situation where um, there was information that students had come forward that there was some sort of weapon in a student's trunk. And um, so that gave, you know, the student coming in to talk to the administration that, um, you know, there might be a safety issue here uh, was enough for the the principal at that time to uh, call the SRO and, and he was involved with um, having the students open the trunk and in fact it was something that they needed but to... As how it would apply to cell phones or... Oh, yeah. Uh, well, they're both legal terms, probable cause and reasonable suspicion, and I'm certain if we Google them we're going to find an explicit definition of them. But a reasonable person might ask, what did you have evidence and what evidence did you have that if you engaged in a search on that cell phone, you would have found something? And, and the burden is on me to say, here's the evidence that was shared with me um, that then caused me to go forward. But I would have to demonstrate that. I couldn't simply open up somebody's phone and look at it because I think there might be something there. Okay, so they're in for the other four are in for additional reading and those will appear for approval next the yeah. five. The five, right. So those five are yeah. Each ready end. for final reading yeah. and approval next at the next meeting. Okay. Which we need to verify before we close when what we're gonna do for the next meeting. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. The uh, the second meeting normally that we would have in January falls on Martin Luther King Day, which is also a no school day, and the following day is a teacher and service day. Uh, and looking at the, the calendar, which Ricky has more convenient than I do. You'd have a meeting on February 4th. On the 4th, yeah. So the question is, do we need to have have anything in between? Is there a reason that we need to meet second time? Uh, you, you've generally missed that meeting. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. I think we have the last, at least the last couple of years. Um, do the committees meet? Uh, well, the Finance Committee will continue to meet because the we have to approve, um, as, as time goes by, we need to meet our twice a month uh, policy would meet if there's, if there's work to be done, the same with the others. Uh, so that would be up to the committee chairs and the administrators they work with for, for those meetings. 
And we would just need to know that so we can warn them. Right. Right. Um, but in terms of full board activity, I mean, the real, the next big thing is the uh, annual meeting and the, uh, but we would have a meeting before that anyway for routine business on the, the 4th, you say? Yeah. It's at 7 o'clock on Monday the 4th. Yeah. So unless there's an objection or any other cogent items that need to come up before then, that would be our next meeting. You have the need to meet? I'm good. Yeah, you have the need to meet. <laughs> we can come up here at 7 o'clock yeah. on the 17th yeah. if you want. I, I may. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, so the, is there another meeting in January? There's not another meeting in January? No, no. no. In, in February? I mean, other than the 13th. Uh, other, other than yeah. the, oh, that's in February. So in February, there's the first meeting, and then just the uh, um, just the town meeting, meeting, not the town meeting, but the district meeting. Yeah, the district the district, district meeting, meeting on the 12th. Yeah. Uh, again, unless there is some need to schedule a second okay. February. If needed. Yes. Yeah. And that's. You know, after the after the annual meeting, it's a little bit of a breather, and that's a time when there usually isn't too many major things that need to be dealt with. And then, as we get into March, uh, we'll get back on a, our regular routine, and I would like to see us get back into our board education uh, mm -hmm. once a month. Um, I think those those have been good during the, the budget time. We get kind of meeting weary, so we. We kind of backed off on that, but uh, we'll start that back up again. And what time is the meeting on the 7th? I mean, on the 12th? Uh, so the annual meeting is at 7. Yeah. It's good right. to get here, um, you know, quarter of at least. And it's here? Uh, it's at the in high school gym. It's in the gym, yeah. yeah. If you get here early, you get to fight for a better seat up on the platform. <laughs> it's a shorter article. Or yeah. sure. No, we'll decide that on yeah. February 4th. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not terribly difficult work reading the articles. Okay, let's see. ESBA self assessment. We're going to hold off on that because I think we still need a few yeah. turned in. We're still missing a few if you have. And I did make a list of who turned them in to me. Some may have turned them in directly, but if you have not, uh, done your board self-assessment uh, form, please please do so. I think that's important information and it'll be a good discussion as to what we need to do to continue to better ourselves. Superintendent evaluation, uh, we will be uh, conducting an executive session at the end of this. And I believe under new business, uh, warning articles, we have the action needed was to sign it. Did you get them all back? Thank you. Okay. Um, anything else before we go into executive session? Okay, if not, um, I would entertain a motion. I move we enter executive session or to later. discuss a personal matter. Yes. Second. Yeah. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Yeah.